I am here with Dr. Ernie Schaefer, and today is August 3rd, 2022. Why don't we just start at the beginning, and before we kind of get into uh, you know, your, your medical education, can you just tell me a little bit about yourself, where you grew up, and kind of what you were like as a child? Sure. I grew up in a small town in uh, Connecticut called Old Lyme. It's probably best known for being the home of Lyme disease, uh, <laughs> foreign arthritis, but it also is home for an uh, artist colony, and, and it's on the mouth of the Connecticut River. So I grew up on the Long Island Sound, and I love mm-hmm. to swim and to to uh, go boating and i had a nice childhood there and who did you live with i had two parents and mm-hmm. uh and three siblings i'm the youngest of four oh, and according wow. to my siblings the most obnoxious <laughs> <laughs> from the early from from the beginning or as from the adult? beginning yeah. <laughs> always Got seeking it. attention i guess <laughs> Got it. well was school something that kind of came easy to you that you enjoyed I went to a public school in Old Lyme and it was, you know, it was easy for me. It wasn't a, a very rigorous school. So uh, when I got to high school, my parents sent me to boarding school at Phillips Academy Andover. That was a lot harder, <laughs> a lot of hard work and studying. Yeah. But it was good for me for the science. Can you tell me a little bit more about that? Yeah. My dad was a doctor. He was more in research. He worked uh, for 30 years for Admiral Rickover in the nuclear Navy. And he was a worked on CO2. He was an MD, but he he did research. So from an early age, uh, unlike my three siblings that wanted to have nothing to do with science and medicine, I thought it was great what he was doing. And that's one of the reasons I went into medicine. You were also the last hope, right? As the <laughs> yeah, I was yeah. the last hope for my father. That's for sure. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so you go to private school, you graduate, and then what? Then I went to uh, Harvard. And I was there for uh, four years. Actually, I took a year off before college just to because I, w- I wanted to get some, uh, I wanted to travel a little bit, I traveled around Europe. I worked at Yale Medical School for half a year. Uh, that was a really good experience. And then I, I went to, to Harvard and um, I was always interested in sports and I played soccer there for four years. And I unfortunately played soccer until I was 45 and coached. And so now I have two partial knee replacements. <laughs> Sports has always been a, a, a real love of my life too. Wow. And I can imagine that it sounds like you went to Harvard then with the idea that you wanted to be a doctor. Yeah. In fact, uh, I I was a biology major and pre-med and there were two classmates of mine that ended up at Mount Sinai that had been in my class at Harvard, uh, uh, Mike Starr and Lauren Skeist. Let me ask, so you, I know that your father had been a researcher. Did you have any sense of whether or not you wanted to go into research or into clinical practice? I had no idea, really. And then after Harvard, I went to Dartmouth Medical School for two years. And in those days, we were children of the 60s. And a lot of us were concerned that the poor were not getting adequate care. Went to see the dean and the dean said, why don't you guys study the problem? So I actually did the a study looking at child care in the first year of life. And this is in Grafton County, New Hampshire. We published it, came to the earth shattering conclusion that the most important determinant of good child care in the first year of life was actually the educational level of the mother. And it didn't have that much to do with the doctor or even the father. <laughs> it had to do with the educational level of the mother and not so much the income. And that then prompted me when I got to Mount Sinai, not to do, go into healthcare delivery, but to do something different. So tell me about how you get from Dartmouth to Mount Sinai. Well, because I got involved in this research project, at that time, the president at Dartmouth, his name was Kemeny. He, he was the guy that developed BASIC, which ultimately led, uh, led to Microsoft and all that stuff. But Bill Gates picked it up. But the bottom line was they had a free computing. And I really got wrapped up in my second year in computing. And my grades suffered a bit. So most of my classmates actually went back to Harvard. I didn't. And actually, that was a wonderful thing for me because I got to go to New York. And I should tell you, for me, the Mount Sinai experience was terrific. And when I compare notes with my classmates that went to Harvard Medical School, I would have to say we had a wonderful experience. So at Dartmouth, there was a professor from University of Vermont whose name was Larry Weed. And he gave us a lecture on 
how to take a history from a patient. And he had this long questionnaire, like a hundred questions. I said, oh my God, I feel like I'm in the weeds. I get to Mount Sinai. The other reason is I, I was about to, I was going to get married and my wife wanted to get a job in New York. And that was another reason to go to New York. And Einstein was another place I could have gone, but we, we liked Manhattan better than the Bronx. So anyway, I get to Mount Sinai and my first attending was a wonderful doctor whose name was Herschel Sclera. And, you know, there's like four of us in a little group. And he says to us, we're about to see our first patient. And he says, look, what do you, what's the first thing you ask the patient when you're talking to them? You ask them, what's the problem? Why are you here? I said, man, this makes sense to me. This is like manna from heaven. <laughs> I'm a simple guy, you know, all these long questionnaires. So he, he by the way, was an unbelievably good, good clinician, Dr. Skleroff. And then the next really important experience for me at Mount Sinai was, well, my first six months there, I roomed with a guy, Ken Edelson, who's a dermatologist at Mount Sinai that I'm still in touch with. But then I got married and moved to, uh, I was in 306 East 96, and that was all good. My wife was actually working in the Bronx, actually. And it seemed like we, even though we were, she was only making about nine grand a year, it seemed like we never had so much money. <laughs> Our expenses were, were low. And so, but because she was working during the summer between my um, third and fourth year, I rotated to the coronary care unit. Uh, the attending there was a very famous man named Dr. Charles K. Friedberg. He wrote the last single author textbook of cardiology. And I remember being amazed. I would take a history and talk to the patient, and then he would come in in five minutes, get more information than I would get in half an hour. So, you know, it was clear that asking the right questions was also terribly important and asking the most pertinent questions. But the other thing that happened in the first week I was there, even though the care was perfect, three people died. And one of them had an autopsy, and I went down to the morgue and looked at the autopsy. And this guy was in his 60s and had severe diffuse coronary disease. In fact, I was amazed that he had lived as long as he did. His arteries were all totally clogged up. So I went back to Dr. Friedberg, and I said to him, gee, what causes this disease? And he said, listen, uh, we're not exactly sure. It has something to do with aging, and it's more common in men and the high blood pressure is important, but why don't you go down to the Jacoby Library and read about it? So I did, and I, I started reading a lot, and um, I did a lot of reading about the Framingham Heart Study, and my lab right now is right here in Framingham, but done a lot of work with the Framingham Heart Study. But what I learned at that time was that it wasn't just age and gender uh, and high blood pressure, it was also high cholesterol and diabetes and smoking. And really the model, Framingham taught us a simple approach. You identify the risk factors for a disease, and then you treat those risk factors. In fact, in the 70s, when I was at Mount Sinai, there were national campaigns to treat high blood pressure, and we showed if you lower blood pressure, you lower the risk of heart disease. And at that time, it was also uh, LDL cholesterol and HDL cholesterol were the good and the bad cholesterol were very important. So I went back to Dr. Friedberg, and I told him these things. And he said, yeah, those things are all important, but cholesterol is not that important because most of these people have relatively normal cholesterols. And that is actually true, but it turns out there was an imbalance in the way they were carried. So after that experience, I was fortunate enough to have an interview with a brilliant man who was head of medicine. His name was Solomon Burson. He was the uh, chairman of medicine at Mount Sinai and would have won the Nobel Prize if he hadn't died. He, he uh, and Rosalind Yallow were the people that first developed radio immunoassays for insulin and, and other hormones. Uh, and Rosalind Yallow didn't win the Nobel Prize in 1977. But uh, Dr. Burson died suddenly of an of a aneurysm in the head. Not so long after I had that interview with him, but what he told me is, look, he said, Ernie, if you're interested in learning about cholesterol and these particles, you should go up and see Dr. Howard Eater at Albert Einstein. So I did that, and I was lucky enough to do a rotation up there with Dr. Eater, and that really led me to then 
sort of devote my my life to working on heart disease prevention, but also seeing patients in a heart disease prevention clinic. And I then was able to do a rotation at the Rockefeller in the same, thanks to Dr. Schaffner, who was then became head of medicine. But I want to go back to Sinai a little bit. Mount Sinai was a brand new medical school, but it was a hospital. It was a powerhouse of a hospital, which had people like Burl Crone, who described Crohn's disease. It had mm-hmm. Uh, Irving Selikoff, who, who discovered asbestosis. You had Alan Guttmacher, who f- founded the Planned Parenthood League. You had, you had all these giants in the field, which you didn't have at Dartmouth. Mm. Dartmouth mm. was sort of a small school with people that were, you know, solid researchers, but they weren't, they weren't, frankly, a, of the same stature. And because it was a new school they paid attention to students and they really gave us a lot of teaching. So I got to talk to the head of medicine. I got to talk to the head of cardiology. And these people were brilliant people. And and you could have a really good discussion with them. Every Sunday morning from nine until 12, we played touch football uh, in front of the Klingenstein Pavilion in Central Park. It was rain or shine. We were out there every Sunday. It was great. It was like... Um, some of the residents, but mostly guys in my class. And we had, a, and it was understood. We played from nine until 12, 12 o'clock, the Puerto Ricans had come and play softball, but we, we were there from nine to 12. And then we, we had a, we could play basketball on Wednesdays over in the nursing students pavilion. Even the attendings came and played basketball. I was a terrible shooter, but I'm a good rebounder. We had a great time. And there was a woman in the nursing school named Inez Greenstadt. And she used to give us free tickets to shows off Broadway, mostly some of the worst shows ever, but they were free. And my wife and I, we saw some of the worst shows in New York, but hell, it was free entertainment on a Friday or a Saturday night. It was awesome. So that was good. So, you know, I stayed at Mount Sinai after medical school. I stayed there for three more years doing an internal medicine residency and a chief residency. And uh, that was a wonderful time for me. So I was actually at Mount Sinai for five years. And I would tell you that the clinical training I got there was unbelievably good. And then I, of course, went on to the National Institutes of Health. I was there for seven years as a head of a clinical division and a senior investigator. But then um, the man that I worked for at the NIH, his name was Robert I. Levy. He was the head of head of the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute. And he was the head of, he started the whole national cholesterol education program. And he became the dean at Tufts. And that's why I got dragged up to Tufts. Got it. In 82, I, and then for 30 years, I basically uh, was a professor at Tufts and ran a clinic and had over 600 papers. We published an awful lot. I've been, had about 50 uh, endocrine fellows that we trained through the clinic, and we had uh, about 40 or 50 postdocs, uh, lots of PA, about 30 PhD students. So I would have to say, you know, in research, the papers that you publish collect dust, but the people that you train are the future, and that's really important. Correct me if I'm wrong, but it sounds like in terms of the area of medicine that you ended up having your career in, it really started with the autopsy on that patient as a, you know, as a new medical It started when Dr. Friedberg said to me, Ernie, why don't you go and read about it? (laughs) We don't understand much about atherosclerosis, go and read about it. So, and that then led me to, to do a research rotation at Einstein. And then also later on during my medical residency for six months at the Rockefeller and that then led me to the NIH. And of course, during my training, when I was a medical student, I, I would uh, apply for uh, some of these research, some of these awards. And there was always one guy that would win the awards. His name was Jeff Flyer. So, so later on, when I was an intern, I got to meet Jeff Flyer because we were interns together. And so I, I understood why he was winning the awards because he was... <laughs> A hell of a lot smarter than me. <laughs> He's terrific. So, I'm sure um, he'll be glad to have that on record. Yeah. Oh, he yeah. knows. He knows that. I've said that to him before. He's up here in Boston, and yeah, I, I see him. Uh, we we see uh, my wife and I see him, he, him and Terry occasionally, and they're really great people. But what the last thing I would tell you is, after doing research for well a long time, 
I play, I like to play bridge and I'm in a bridge group as well as a tennis group. So uh, one night at, at a bridge game, a guy, this is in 2006, a guy says to me, Ernie, your, your, your bridge is lousy. Uh, you don't count cards very well, but you have some good ideas. Why don't you start a business, a lab business? So I said, oh, you got to be kidding. I'm a disorganized old professor here. He said, no, no, I'll help you with the, with the venture capital. And, and so we did, yeah. So in 2007, we founded Boston Heart Diagnostics, which provides testing to doctors all over the country. We're not a huge lab, but we, we've reached probably over two or three million people in this space. So we provide state-of-the-art testing. Of course, we all, since we're a high-complexity lab, because of the pandemic, we also have done a lot of COVID testing and antibody testing, but gradually getting back to, to our bread and butter, which is um, the same thing that killed that patient back at Mount Sinai back in 1971. Yeah. So interesting, full circle. I love that the idea was germinated over a bridge game as well. That's great. Yeah. Well, bridge <laughs> is, a, is a social game too. And, and uh, I'll relate one other story to you. At the NIH, we had very rare, unusual patients. And one patient that we had had this disease called Tangier disease, named after Tangier Island in the Chesapeake Bay. But this disease is is characterized by uh, not not being able to get cholesterol out of your cells. So this guy was developing not just heart disease, but developing these cholesterol deposits in his gut. And this is before we we had statins to optimize all the other risk factors, including the lipids, other than HDL. Anyway, he developed all these deposits and he developed an intestinal obstruction. And I was the head of the service and they took him up to the OR and I went to the OR and they were going to remove 23 feet of his intestine. And I said to them, no, just close him up. They looked at me like I was crazy, but they did what I said. They closed him up and I brought him back down to the ward and uh, he had IV lines in. So one thing I learned from Dr. Crone in the patients with Crone disease was if some, if he never, he was trying to spare his patients from getting feet and uh, of intestines removed because of obstruction. So I did what he told, taught us to do. I put down an NG tube with a a mercury filled plastic bag on it. And I did that. And sure enough, in 24 hours, it went all the way through, unobstructed him. And then the dietitian put him on uh, small liquid feedings. He was 53 at the time. He lived for another 20 years and died in his sleep in Beaver Dam, Kentucky. And that was all from the, what, the training I got. That's what Burl Crone t- taught me. Now, he was 90 years old, but he believed, you know, if you could avoid surgery in a patient with uh, Crohn's disease, you, w- you were doing them a big favor because after a while, they kept they losing more and more of their intestine. That's an example of doctors who really know what they're doing and who, who have a, a sense for how to manage patients. So there were lots of really good doctors at Mount Sinai. Mar, uh, Marvin Levitt in, in kidney disease was wonderful. We had Ezra Greenspan, who was probably the first oncologist to do a combination a chemotherapy for breast cancer and for other cancers. Yeah, so it was a great hospital. And I was very privileged to not just be there for two years of medical school, but for three years of residency training. And to to this day, one of the things that Dr. Burson, by measuring insulin, and we do this in our lab today for doctors, and I've had discussions, and even guys at the Joslin don't do this. It turns out that uh, after Dr. Burson developed the RIA for insulin with Dr. Yellow, People use the assay, but not that much. But we use the assay every day, and we calculate something called a homeostasis model assessment of insulin resistance and production. And why is that important? Because a lot of patients, 90% of patients or more, are what we call type 2 diabetics, and they are resistant to the effects of insulin. However, over time, their pancre- the beta cells in their pancreas uh, wears out and they, they can't produce enough insulin anymore. And Oxford people have another equation called a HOMA beta, which allows you to calculate the production of insulin. And so we can tell doctors, listen, 
your patient is probably going to need insulin pretty soon because right now 25% of diabetics will end up on insulin because their pancreas burns out. Mm. And it's because of this area is still growing and the need for insulin is there. And unfortunately, mm. the med- it's quite expensive. Hopefully they'll, they'll overhaul the drug, drug pricing, but Dr. Burson helped us measure insulin and taught us about insulin resistance and also mm. about insulin production. I can imagine that practicing medicine looks very different, at least from a clinical perspective, than it did 50 years ago, as you know, as does research. But what would you tell a prospective medical student? Any advice or bits of wisdom that you would give them? One of the things I've learned is how prevention is really important, lab testing really, to figure out. Studies like Framingham taught us about the importance of risk factors for heart disease and treating those risk factors. That's probably a, not an unreasonable approach for other diseases as well, certain forms of cancer, uh, Alzheimer's disease, or dementia. So treating the risk factors for, say, dementia, or treating the risk factors for prostate or breast cancer, that approach often for the common diseases works better than because there is no one, there is no one cause. You know, mm-hmm. right now there's a big controversy in the dementia space because by God, not everybody has a mutation in beta amyloid protein. What a surprise. You know, when you have a disease like dementia that's very common, especially in people as they get older, look at the risk factors and we know what they are. The problem, of course, is we don't have all the randomized placebo-controlled trials that we need, but you have to start somewhere. I think the future will be to understand all these things more, but also to figure out how to do things more cheaply and more inexpensively and and to figure out how to deliver healthcare in a much better way. We have the best medical system in the world, but we probably have the worst healthcare delivery. It's a crazy system. I actually am a fan of a more of a socialized kind of system. You know, we run a lab, our best payer, they pay the least, but they pay, and that's called Medicare. Um, and it's it's better to it's better to get paid, you know, on a regular basis for your work. The big health insurance companies are just trying to find ways not to pay for anything. And and that's their their modus of operandi. And it's unfortunate. Well, it sounds too like what you're saying is for, for any new prospective student, work on catching the problem upstream. Yeah, yeah. Well, if you can identify somebody genetically, if you can identify a high PSA for prostate, if you can identify breast cancer on a mam- mammography very early. Uh, for solid tumors, the best game in town is called surgery. Get it, get it out, get, get rid of it before it spreads. Once a, a bad solid tumor like breast or prostate spreads, it, they can be very nasty. Yeah. So these are things that are important um, for the future. Yeah, I, I would say and, and stay interested for the rest of your life and, mm. and do find a passion. Yeah, yeah, stay curious and find something that yeah. lights you up. Yeah, yeah. I'm still working full time and I'm I'm about to turn 77 in November. So I'm I, I'm going to keep working until my wife puts me in a box. What can I tell you? <laughs> <laughs> Which hopefully will be after you're gone, not before, right? <laughs> well, it's interesting. Uh, you're not going to believe this, but last Sunday, uh, my oldest brother and my sister, who's a judge in Connecticut, my oldest brother runs a company in Western Mass. We we each bought uh, plots in the old Lyme Cemetery, <laughs> so we'd have a place to put our ashes. <laughs> well, I'm I'm glad that even though you were the obnoxious brother, they're letting you, you know, rest beside them. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. That's right. I, they could have put me on the other side of the cemetery. Right. 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 Uh, well, let me just ask you just a few few last questions, which is, uh, what hopes do you have for Mount Sinai, Mount Sinai Medical School in the future? Uh, there was a fellow that was a year behind us at Mount Sinai, uh, whose name was Ken Davis. And he was very smart. And I think uh, he ended up going into psychiatry. But I think at one time, somebody told me, I think he wanted to be the head of the place. And he is the head of the place now. It shows you, you have to have aspirations. Mm -hmm. What I would say about Mount Sinai is they have done extremely, extremely well. Uh, They've become really the largest a hospital system in in Manhattan, largely because of guys like Ken Davis that have 
I think they bought up St. Luke's. They bought up, um, I think, Beth Israel as part of their system. When I was there, of course, Columbia's big. And while wow, Cornell, Cornell, my, my son went to medical school actually at Cornell, my youngest son, who's, who's a radiologist now, just finishing his, finished his training at the Brigham in Boston. And now is starting to practice at Salem Hospital up in Salem, Mass. So, but uh, I think I'm not in a good position to give Mount Sinai advice. They're doing really well on their own. <laughs> and I think Ken Davis is doing a great job. I haven't talked to him in years, but uh, I know Jeff has talked to him about doing better for uh, for the 50th reunion. I guess it's unfortunate that they canceled it. Uh, so Dartmouth, um, I finished there in 70. We did have our, our reunion this past spring. So that worked out pretty well, but this damn virus doesn't seem to want to go away. Is there anything else that we didn't cover or that you want to make sure gets captured? I, w- I would say if the medical student, you know, nowadays the question always is, in my day, it was still possible to be a triple threat. When I say that, you could be a professor, which I was for 30 years. You could be, um, and you could also run a clinic and you could, so you could do teaching and you could do research. I think those days are becoming more more difficult. I think uh, find find a passion and, and try to make a contribution. That's all we can do. I, I think it's hard to know. All I can say is that Mount Sinai is a great institution, and I I feel very fortunate to have spent five years of my life there. Those were very pivotal years. Uh, My wife and I loved living in New York, loved playing touch football in Central Park, loved going to the museums and and the lousy off-Broadway shows, Um, just loved it. And the people were terrific to me. And uh, I think it's a great place. It's a great, it's become a great medical school but it was always a great hospital for many, many years. And now it's become, I think, probably the largest hospital system in New York. Thanks to people like Ken Davis. Well, uh, really, my last question is, what was this experience like for you, reflecting back on your time in medical school and kind of your career trajectory? Well, it was pivotal. It, it, Mm -hmm. it, uh, I mean, a lot of people in my class or in my resident class ended up in practice. I kind of got bitten by the research bug a bit, but I always liked seeing patients and I still Mm -hmm. do see patients, but not very often, you know, Mm -hmm. mostly over the computer like we're doing Mm -hmm. now. Mm -hmm. So I think uh, for me, Mount Sinai opened my eyes to the power of clinical medicine and the power of really trying to answer questions as they come along. People like Dr. Friedberg said, why don't you go and figure it out? Why don't you go and read about it? It made all the difference to me. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Schaefer. This was a pleasure. Thank you, Becca. It's been a pleasure talking to you. 